Hello. Hello. Is my UTSA, is it backwards? On no, the, it looks oh. backwards to okay. you. Okay, I've right. never done one of these. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, all our, all our speakers are on, getting on at least. They follow instructions well. I you love it. It's 11.45. Yes. Our moderators, I think the only one missing right now. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming to our second community lecture series. I'm Lynn Cosman, and in case you don't know, I am the Dean of UTSA's new College for Health Community and Policy. This is our first annual community lecture series, and this lecture is the second in the series. We really did hope to be able to meet you all in person today, but it seems this semester will be one of transition. So as we're moving back to in-person activities, we didn't wanna hold off on having the series. So we chose instead to go ahead virtually for this month and next month. We have a very exciting panel to present to you today. And I would like to thank them all for their participation here today. Without further ado, I will pass the microphone, so to speak, to council member Courage. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today, Dean. Uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about strengthening the support for veterans of tomorrow. Uh, you know, there are a lot of discussions that have been ongoing about how we work with our veterans. The discussion, this discussion intends to widen the conversation around services and areas that are provided for veterans, thus creating more conversation around veterans' journeys and ultimately more access to healthcare, food, and creating environments that they can thrive in. Again, my name's John Courage. I'm a San Antonio City Councilman for District 9. I'm also a Vietnam era Air Force veteran. I was a military policeman in the Air Force. And I'm honored today to moderate this distinguished panel. Uh, what I'd like to do is go ahead and at this time introduce our panelists. Uh, we have, first of all, Mr. Ted Terrazas, who's the Senior Vice President of Medical and Business Services at Chenega Corporation, and Christopher R. Sandless, Medical Center Director and CEO of the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System, and Dr. Paul Skoll, Colonel USAF Retired, Director of Military and Veterans Affairs Division at the Alamo Area Council of Governments. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to give you a little bit more about each panelist. So, as I said, uh, Ted Terrazas is Senior Vice President of Medical and Business Services at Chenega. Mr. Terrazas has been uh, with them for 40 years, or has, excuse me, 40 years of experience working with federal contracting as a Senior Vice President of Medical and Business Services. His responsibilities include communicating Chenega's uh, Chenega's medical strategic vision, performing strategic and tactical planning, business development, budget control, execution for all business aspects, and monitoring service quality for contracts. Ted communicates and coordinates with key stakeholders to ensure business objectives and values are achieved. He serves as a senior advisor on administrative and technical support contracts, providing strategic planning and program support for Chenega on healthcare business administrative and research support contracts. Christopher Sandless, as I said, is the medical center director and CEO for the South Texas Veterans Health System. He was appointed medical center director on March 3rd, 2019. With the fiscal year 20 budget, of $101 billion and 4,300 employees, Sandals oversees healthcare services for about 100,000 unique veterans. In, in fiscal year uh, 2019, the South Texas veteran Veterans Healthcare System provided 1.8 million outpatient visits 
to area veterans. From February 2017 to March 2019, Mr. Sandler served as director for the Central Texas Veterans Healthcare System in Temple, Texas. Sandless has 16 years of progressively responsible healthcare leadership roles, beginning in healthcare career, beginning his healthcare career in 2002 at Covenant Health System in Lubbock, Texas. In 2003, he was accepted into the Government Health Administration Training Program and served his po as his postgraduate fellowship at VA North Texas Healthcare System in Dallas. His VA service includes positions as Associate Director at Houston VA Medical Center, Assistant Director at VA Greater Los, Los Angeles Healthcare System, Chief of Health Administration Service at VA Loma Linda Healthcare System, Assistant Chief of Medical Administration at VA North Texas Healthcare System, Special Assistant to the, the Director of VA North Texas Healthcare System, and Administrative Director for Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at VA North Texas Healthcare System. And finally on our panel, we have Dr. Paul Skoll, Colonel USAF retired, Director of Military and Veterans Affairs Division at the Alamo Area Council of Government. Uh, Dr. Skoll is responsible for our compatible use programs with Joyce, Joint Base San Antonio, Rides for Texas Veterans, the Texas Veterans Network, and Veterans Directed Care. Paul leads an outstanding team dedicated to preserving JBSA's mission and ensuring veterans have continued and supportive access to housing, employment, transportation, education, medical care, and subsistence. This network operates across 27 Texas counties, supported by 190 network partners and over 40, 460 individual intake and referral specialists. Paul is a retired USF, US Air Force Colonel, having served for 35 years, including three combat tours, command at the squadron and NATO group levels, joint operations and nuclear and security operations. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel today, and we wanna thank you all for joining us. I'd like to go ahead and uh, begin with the, the questioning. And uh, I'd like to start out by asking each of you if you could respond to what is the landscape for veterans today? Uh, we'll also have a bit of a slide share presentation to kind of go along with this. So I'd like to begin uh, by asking if Paul would like to go ahead and comment on this. Uh, thank you, Councilman Kurz. I appreciate that and appreciate the uh, invitation to be here today. I believe that the current landscape that we see for veterans in the San Antonio area is that we have, first of all, one of the largest areas uh, in Texas. We have over 200,000 veterans and we have more and more every day as people leave the service and transition to veteran status. Uh, the landscape that we have is that we do have, I think, a wealth of services, but our challenge is to get that information out to our veterans and those that are soon to be veterans as they transition in order to make sure that we have the services in place for them and they understand what those services are and how to reach them. As was stated earlier, it's much easier to try to reach out to our veterans. That's our goal. That's why we look at those places where veterans are transitioning, where they're going to be uh, throughout their time as veterans in order to make sure that we advertise the programs that we have. I think for veterans, I think now, I think the level of care that's available for them, the level of assistance and the dedication of personnel within the world serving veterans has increased, and I think they're at a good time for that. Councilman, I believe you're muted. Isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> it is. I'd uh, like to ask Mr. Terrazas if he'd care to comment on this as well now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. And I'd also like to add that I'm also a, a veteran and retired uh, Air Force Medical Service Corps officer uh, to, to those qualifications. Uh, with, with that said, 
there's approximately 19 million veterans. About 2.5 million of those uh, have been vaccinated. Uh, of other 19 million, about 5.2 million are disabled veteran uh, veterans. Uh, and about with those, those, those 5.2 million, about 25 million disabilities. So that's about five disabilities per, per veteran. Uh, in this era of COVID and uh, what, what, has, what has occurred, of course, the risk factors are age and respiratory uh, illnesses. And uh, keep in mind that 73% of these veterans are over the age of 50 and 89% of them are male. So uh, a, a vulnerable population with about 12 million of them uh, that have passed away due to COVID. And this is a, as of May, uh, at least the, uh, the my May report numbers. Um, and with COVID, we also had a lot of isolation and we had delays in appointments for a lot of very various reasons uh, that many of you have also experienced. Uh, but this isolation causes other issues like, like suicide. Uh, more suicidal tendencies, and we lose about 20 veterans per day uh, to, to suicide. And of this uh, 19 million veteran group, we have about uh, the largest group of, is with what we call the Gulf War era. And those folks were, were exposed to toxins, mainly from oil, oil fires, burn pits. And then the second group is those that were Vietnam era exposed to Agent Orange. So after every conflict, there seems to be uh, a discovery of, a, of an issue that has affected our veterans. So that's on the, on the national scale. John, you're muted again. Thank you. There's a lot of issues I know that we've been concerned about for veterans. Uh, I have a lot of friends who served and uh, are, are constantly aware of the struggles that that they face. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Chandless, uh, excuse me, Mr. Sandals, uh, what are some of the issues that you also see uh, in the landscape of veterans today? I uh, appreciate the question, uh, Congressman Courage. Sandless Sandals, actually that's a, it's a debate with him. <laughs> I, can, I can share that at a, at a later time. I've got a lot of family in California, they all go by Sandless. Uh, here in Texas, we go by Sandals. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the question, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Really, I, I agree with um, really all I heard the two prior gentlemen share with you. I'd say on the uh, health care landscape, um, you know, again, a lot of what I heard uh, Paul share, I would completely agree with. I think this is um, a, a, a good time uh, to be a veteran. I think there's much more recognition of things that um, veterans are challenged with. I would, uh, we hear about uh, not just access to care, but mental health in particular. I think this is something that society as a whole uh, is beginning to acknowledge. So I think it's, it's making it uh, a more welcoming environment uh, for veterans that are interested in engaging us for that type of care. Uh, I also think uh, San Antonio as a community, obviously we're here because this is a very welcoming market uh, for military life and for, uh, for veterans. And so it's made it, I think, much easier for us as a healthcare system to continue to make Inroads. I think one of the challenges uh, for uh, for veterans is uh, which door to enter, right? And so I think as agencies continue to communicate more effectively together, whether it's through forums like this, uh, through interagency data exchanges, uh, partnering with uh, you know community agencies, the more interconnected we are, I think the tighter the net is, and the more difficult it is for veterans to pull through it. Uh, and I'm seeing more and more of that uh, at the local and at the national level. So I think the landscape is is not perfect, but it's definitely improved over, let's say, what our Vietnam era veterans and those before them would have encountered coming out of service. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, my own experiences, there are a lot of organizations in San Antonio and in Texas that are committed to helping veterans in a lot of the different areas, whether it's medical, job, finance, things of that nature. Uh, and I think it's trying to gain access to those that's always a challenge. At this time, uh, we're gonna present a polling question to the audience. We hope that all of you will participate in this. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and have you go ahead and look at the question, are you a veteran or related to one? And please respond to this. We'll give you all a, a few seconds to go ahead and, and act on it on your computer.
Okay, as you can see right now, we have 76% uh, of the people who are on our call today and, and listening to this discussion are veterans or are related to one. Uh, and I think that it just shows the importance of this discussion today to people in the community. And of course, to the population at, at UTSA, because we understand many of the uh, students enrolled there uh, have been in the service or are related to people who've been in the military. So thank you for your response to that poll. Second question we're gonna go ahead and present at this time. Uh, what are the most relevant challenges veterans face and how can we overcome those? And I'll ask Dr. Scholl to go ahead and uh, kind of give us a, a first entry, entry to that. Thank you. I think part of the uh, challenge that we have for access and navigating out of the military if we take those as two separate pieces and look at just transferring out of the military, uh, there are two things that can happen. Uh, the, first of all, everyone is required to take a transition assistance program class. And depending upon who's teaching that and how they're teaching it uh, will affect, I believe, the outcome for what the, that veteran or that transitioning service member understands or retains. The other thing is that having gone through, whether it's four, six, 20 or more years, we, we've we been through a lot of training. And another training class is just not what we're looking for, especially at the very end here. And we have a tendency, and I base that on my experience and watching others in the classes that I attended uh, as I transitioned to look at this uh, as a tick the box uh, requirement. Uh, that I think does us a disservice. I think one of the things that needs to be done with the TAB classes is to make it very, uh, know, make it known to veterans or you know, transitioning service members that this is something that's going to set the foundation for a lot of other things in life as we continue on in our veteran status. It probably won't be applicable today, but it's going to be applicable at various times. And so to take this and one of those things that as we transition to file away and keep that file so that we can refer to this. The access portion of that is something that we need to make known. And that's why with uh, uh, Ms. Hernandez asked if we could use uh, or had any problem giving our emails out and no, she'll do that. I have no problem with that. Because if somebody needs to reach out and ask a question of how do I get access to this, that's exactly what we're here for. And whether they enter that for ACOG through the Texas Veterans Network or enter it just by emailing one of the, the people within uh, our directorate, uh, that doesn't matter. We'll get that person hooked up with the, uh, the services that they need. Uh, I've got an extremely dedicated, very professional team that not only listens to the requested service, but will talk with them and listen for other needed areas so that we can make sure that we address those needs that uh, our veterans have. Thank you. And let me ask uh, Mr. Terrazas, you know, when we talk about challenges and then we talk about services, uh, how do you see those challenges being faced uh, by our veterans today? Well, the good news is, is, uh, is that the, the veterans are, are being listened to. I think that it's a very uh, high profile issue, especially when we have so many of our, our veterans. Uh, but as you take a, if you take a look at this, uh, at this slide, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of use this, is we talk, we talk about a lot of issues that they face, but at the very top, you'll, you'll see where we have uh, an exposure or a threat. And it seems like every conflict, we learn something of a new type of weapon system, a new type of uh, exposure, whether it be to a burn or to oil, uh, uh, burned fumes uh, or ancient orange, there is something that they get exposed to. We learn something from that. And this, by the way, is a, is a perfect role where UTSA and, and their college uh, fits in really well because when they when there's a threat or there's an exposure like this and we have to learn from it, uh, there's a gap. There's a gap in knowledge. There's a gap in technology. There's a gap uh, in in trying to understand the problem. And so therefore we we identify it. 
the research is conducted. We get learn, we learn from that research in new uh, 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 education that we need to train providers, we need to train our communities and how to deal with them. And then we also are, are then able, able to formulate new clinical protocols, new treatment therapies, new uh, technologies to, um, to go ahead and, and, uh, and resolve some of these issues as, as both uh, an institution like the Veterans Administration or as a, as a community. Uh, the VA has done a really good job and they also do a lot of research with, within the Veterans Administration, but there's a lot of research that's also done outside the Veterans Administration, whether it be by grants or, or contracts and, and taking a look at this. But you know the challenges are, are still the same. We have uh, individuals being uh, uh, denied dis disabilities, uh, delayed in disability, disability assessments and, and benefits, uh, and the service connection uh, of that. But mental health still tends to plague uh, a lot of veterans in, in so many different ways. We talked about suicide just a, just a while, while ago. But the problem with, with, with mental health is a lot of them uh, either don't realize it, don't want, don't want the help, uh, they they self medicate in areas in, in whether it be drugs other other unacceptable drugs or or alcohol and these are, of course bring other problems within the population. Uh, you know we talk about uh, in, in, on the slide their lack of education on unemployment. We do know that employment and the higher uh, earning capability uh, uh, also increases the wellness uh, probability of a, of an individual and vets uh, struggle with that especially when they're trained to go to war and they come back and they're re-entered uh, into the civilian population and then try, try to then determine their value and also how do they fit within the job the job market. So there's, there's continuous struggles with that. I'll stop there because I don't want to dominate the conversation. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Sandless, you've had, of course, most of uh, your experience in the medical side. And when we talk about veterans' challenges, I think many of them are related to uh, physical disabilities or conditions from their time of service. Uh, you know, how do you feel uh, veterans are facing those challenges and uh, what can be done to help them overcome those? Yeah, great question. And, and again, I agree a lot of what I heard, uh, what I heard Paul say earlier about that initial uh, transition out of service, right? We have a I'd say, um, you know, while there are a good number of retirees and those that do 20 or 30 years, uh, the majority do not, right? So we've got a lot that are getting out uh, much younger. Uh, and uh, they're like any of us, when we're in our 20s or early 30s, we think we're um, uh, invulnerable, right? Impervious. We don't really uh, take into account some of the physical injuries. We don't think it's important to document those things in our military medical records. So uh, when they get out several years later, they're uh, in some cases, um, uh, regretting uh, that decision, uh, you know, they, they didn't have that issue evaluated when they were uh, active duty, so that they could more appropriately file that claim. It would be easy uh, to file that information to um, file that request for uh, service connection on the on the VBA side. Uh, similarly, though, on the VHA side, which is where I am, the healthcare arm of uh, of VA, which actually I'll, I'll clarify that really quick for folks. You know, I'll, I'll tell uh, your audience since I saw about thirty percent of them were not veterans and not connected to the VA. Uh, a lot of folks, when they think about VA, don't know exactly what it is, or if they do think they know what it is, they think it's just hospitals, but that's actually not the case. Uh, so VA is the Veterans Administration, and there are three administrations that together uh, create the Department of Veterans Affairs. Right? You have VHA, that's the Veterans Health Administration, that's why I work for it, we're the largest uh, healthcare provider in the United States. A lot of folks don't know that either. Uh, so you may see commercials for university health, uh, and, but I'll tell you, if you uh, look at the number of uh, patients retreat and the number of healthcare systems, the Veterans Health Administration is the largest in the country. Uh, so you've got VHA, then you have VBA, uh, which it sounds like um, uh, uh, Mr. Draws is, is, uh, does quite a bit of work there on the claim side with, with VBA. Uh, so we're, you know, service connected um, uh, claims for veterans. You may hear folks say they're 30 or 40 or 50, 100% service connected. All that's processed on the VBA side. And then the last administration for us is NCA, the National Cemetery Administration. So if you don't know anything about the VA, now you know that we're three administrations that together create the Department of Veterans Affairs. So on the VHA side, as you talk about challenges, uh, again, I said one of them is just maybe not taking that uh, uh, process when they're transitioning out of military service as uh, seriously as they should. 
in our case on, in healthcare, sometimes that results in folks coming to us in crisis. Um, so, um, you know, not acknowledging some of those needs, especially as we talk about PTSD and other mental health conditions, uh, it can create situations where you know, they've had a distance from service, uh, either themselves or families start to recognize this, this is not the same person uh, that we knew before and they need help. Uh, so they'll come to us uh, in, uh, in crisis. Uh, the other issue is that I mentioned this earlier, there are just so many doors. Some don't know how to enter VA. They make an assumption that if I apply for benefits uh, through VBA and I get 30% service connected, that that's an auto enrollment in VHA for healthcare. That's not the case. Uh, so we're trying to do a better job Again, getting that net tighter you know, so that we've got VBA representatives on site in our VHA facilities to try to educate and ensure that, you know, uh, as many benefits uh, that a veteran is eligible for and entitled to with a VA and that we try to connect them uh, with all those, um, uh, all of those opportunities at once. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the other challenges, I'll call it trust and stigma. You know, I, um, I joined the VA 17 years ago, and I'll tell everyone here, it's not the same agency it was 17 years ago, and I joined, and it sure as hell isn't the same VA that my great, uh, my grandfather on both sides, who are uh, Korean War veterans, and both, I didn't share earlier, both of my parents are uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, and so um, it, the agency is changing, and we see that in a lot of our trust scores, but some of our uh, younger veterans, if they don't have uh, other military service members in their family, maybe they haven't used VA recently, there may be a historic stigma of what kind of the quality of care that VA provides, or in some cases, how accessible that care is. Uh, but I'll tell you, our trust scores say something completely different. Uh, and so we, we survey veterans at nauseum. And uh, I'd say eight years ago, 45% uh, of veterans said that they trusted VA to provide the care and services they needed, 45%. Uh, today, just uh, we just got the numbers for October, that number is 90%, right? So we got 90% of veterans saying they trust the VA to provide the care and services that they need. But for those that are relying on a historic stigma, they wouldn't know that uh, because they haven't tried to re-engage or engage the agency for the first time and realize the plethora of services that we provide. Uh, I'd say one of the, the final challenges, because again, I don't want to dominate the time, is a lot of folks don't know the difference uh, between what a VA healthcare system provides. They may think of us as a VA hospital, right? And think that we're only an acute care institution, but that's not true. We are... Uh, the definition of an accountable care organization and integrated both vertically and horizontally. So in addition to providing acute hospital-based care, which of course we provide medicine, surgery, et cetera, uh, we also have our own acute psychiatric units. We have a plethora of outpatient behavioral health programs. We have residential treatment programs. We have substance use treatment programs. We also have basic primary care services. Uh, so we've got a, a huge portfolio of services that we can offer veterans, not just to address acute care issues, but also to address wellness. Uh, we are actually here in San Antonio, a flagship whole health facility. So every veteran that enrolls in one of our primary care teams gets a whole health coach assigned. Uh, we, they will walk them through other options like Tai Chi and yoga and acupuncture, non-medication based uh, treatments that they can uh, engage in to address stress uh, and also reduce you know, issues like opioid addiction. So a lot, of, a lot of services that we provide and we try to get more folks engaged and take them on. Well, Mr. Santos, I think that was very thorough and it really went into kind of a, another part of this, this question, which was about opportunities. And I think you mentioned quite a few of the opportunities through the VA system. Uh, and so that was very helpful. I wanted to see if, uh, you know, anyone else has something they'd like to add about that, Dr. Skoll. Uh, what else do you think about opportunities for veterans? I think uh, opportunities for veterans as far as uh, services uh, is increasing. Uh, somebody just mentioned on the uh, chat that uh, word of mouth is as vital as networking uh, and as uh, in the advertisement. And I have to absolutely agree with that. Uh, the reason for that is because if you, as uh, Chris was talking about, uh, if you look at the somebody with a prior feeling of the VA, they're going to reach back to a uh, different time in the, the administration's history. If you look at it now, it's completely different, but a lot of people don't understand that. So being able to talk with people that uh, have had outstanding care, and I'm one of them. I mean, everything that I've dealt with the VA has been absolutely outstanding. My brother-in-law is currently uh, uh, recovering from... Uh, uh, from knee surgery at a VA hospital and is, is doing very well. He has nothing 
but good things to say about the care he's gotten over all the years. I think we need to get that word out. I think we also need to, when we work with veterans, it's one thing to say, okay, here's a service and send them off to go talk to that service. That's one way of doing it. And it tends to be a typical way of doing it. Our te Texas Veterans Network, we try to close the loop. So what we'll do is we'll refer that person to one of our service providers making sure that they are picked up by the service provider and making sure that there's resolution to that service and then we close that case. So if somebody needs uh, transportation assistance, we get them to one of our providers, we make sure that they've gotten that and make sure that they've gotten where they need to go and back. If it needs to be reoccurring, that they're set up for uh, continual support and then we mark that as a closed case. We simply, we don't simply say, yes, we help somebody today simply because we made a referral. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Tarasas, anything you might add to that? No, I think it was, it was well covered. I, obviously technology plays a role too in, uh, uh, in one, of the, one of the other difficulties is compliance with medications and other things. And some of the systems and technologies uh, are, are able through, the, through a cell phone, for example, to send reminders, to keep them in communication, to be able to have uh, at better access to, to providers in a safety network. Right, that's another important tool nowadays, communication and uh, cell phones, computers, technology. Uh, you know, I think another thing to consider right now is, you know, how can we, you and I and the people in our community become uh, agents of change uh, regarding uh, veterans issues, veterans and, and their lives. And one thing I'll mention is the city of San Antonio, I think does a really important job of trying to work with veterans individually and collectively. We've got a city of San Antonio Veterans Commission made up of uh, residents of every city council district who served in the military, who try to work on issues that affect the lives of uh, people in San Antonio, whether you're a veteran or a family member of a veteran, or for that matter, even active duty military families. And every council committee uh, or every council office has its own uh, work group uh, on veterans issues. And I certainly do in District 9. Uh, but how can the rest of the community become agents of change? Uh, I'll just open that up for any of the three of you who would like to go ahead and maybe make a remark on that. Who'd like to go first? I'll say a comment. Um, I guess the, you're right, I did mention opportunities before the, the two brief opportunities I, I, I wanna mention that I'll talk about your last question. Uh, one would be um, some of the ongoing activities between VHA and DOD on seamless transition. Uh, so we are working on that. Uh, there's a national work group engaged to try to make that process a bit more seamless. Uh, so that as service members are transitioning from active duty, there are, you know, for those services that they are automatically eligible for, we can go ahead and auto enroll them. So I'm, I'm anxious to see how that materializes. The other opportunity I think uh, really exists in our community here in San Antonio is um, we talk about word of mouth. I saw someone use that comment, uh, but I would specifically encourage us to engage women veterans. Uh, this is one of the fastest growing segments in, uh, uh, in the veteran population across the country. It's growing at twice the rate uh, of male veterans at the National level, you know, male enrollment is up 5%, female veteran enrollment is up 11%. So it's growing rapidly. Uh, and again, I think the more we engage that group uh, and help them feel comfortable engaging VA, uh, the better off we'll all be. Uh, your other comment about um, you know, what can the community do to engage, I'd say um, uh, maybe uh, three or four quick things. First, and this, this may sound horrible, but I, it's well-intentioned, uh, would be to do more than push-ups. Right, one of the things that, um, I've, I've seen over the past couple of years are folks doing the 20 or 21 push-ups a day uh, for the veterans you know, that they say commit suicide in the United States. Uh, but one of the things that a lot of folks don't know is that 13 of those 20 veterans are not enrolled in VA health care. Uh, and so push-ups are great. Finding a way to engage a, a veteran one-on-one -on -one and encourage them to get help, especially if you identify someone in need, uh, that actually makes a difference. Uh, it, it would also be encouraging service, right? I, I don't know how many folks on the call have ever been uh, to a VA medical center, right? There are 
a multitude of opportunities to volunteer both with us, I'm sure with many of the community agencies uh, throughout San Antonio. So find a way uh, to, uh, to actually get engaged. Uh, third, and uh, but definitely not least, would be uh, to donate. Uh, whether it's in a, if you work for a federal agency, we've got the combined federal campaign, but there's other avenues for you to donate, you know, a couple bucks a pay period uh, to a really worthy cause to a variety of veteran facing organizations. And I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. You know, I thought that was pretty comprehensive, pretty comprehensive there, Chris. Um, the only thing I would, I would, uh, other thing I would add is, is advocate. Uh, and the reason I, I, I say that is because uh, I'm sure that, for example, in Chris and Paul's area of influence, that they would like to have a better budget. I think the demand sometimes ex uh, exceeds the, the resources, and I'm sure more resources would, 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 would be valuable uh, to them in, the, in their programs. Uh, and these, these programs are, are not just uh, direct care, but also in research in UTSA so that we can do more uh, study uh, and the impacts so that we can find better ways to uh, manage and, and bring these veterans to a uh, uh, more suitable wellness uh, in their life. Thank you. Dr. Sloan. I, I think that um, one of the best ways to be an agent of change and it doesn't matter if it's ACOG and Texas Veterans Network, whether it's UTSA's military a Center for Military Affiliated Students, or which area you look at. Understand the resources that are out there that where you can make an initial referral. And for veterans and veteran families, um, I, one thing that I do think is important, especially for those members who have been our combat veterans. There is no one who has deployed and come back exactly the same. There is some change somehow, and that needs to be understood. And whether it, it manifests itself in so many different ways. Uh, for PTSD, there's, uh, as, as Dr. Morris said, and she's uh, much more familiar with this, but there's a cutoff on the evaluation scale. And Dr. Morris said, I apologize, but I'm just gonna use 50 as a cutoff number. If you have 50 or above, you have PTSD. If you have 49 and below, you don't. But what's the difference between 49 and 50? And people have to understand that and be open to assistance. And in full disclosure, you know, I saw somebody actually talk to a um, clinical uh, a, a counselor friend of mine and then saw somebody at JBSA. It turns out, no, I didn't have uh, PTSD. I just had a very stressful daughter. And uh, knowing that piece put my mind at ease and was, was I was able to work things differently. I think the, there is a huge barrier for veterans seeking uh, any type of mental health support um, you know, I grew up in a time under personal reliability program that if you saw mental health, you were done. That was it. You were most likely gone uh, if in the worst case and in the best case, you'd be transferred to some other uh, specialty that didn't require that. Uh, we still have that. We still have the residual feeling of that as veterans and as military members. And unfortunately, we still have that in the command climate, which is absolutely terrible. We need to look at mental health as seriously as we look at our physical and spiritual health. You know, I'd like to add to this discussion uh, because we talked about mental health throughout, I think. But um, I'd like any of your uh, ideas on the veterans homeless issue that we have. In our community and in communities across the country, I think the general public uh, looks at homelessness as the kind of issue that they, they think needs to be resolved. Uh, and a lot of veterans uh, are homeless and are suffering from some problems, uh, basically probably mental illness issues that they're not getting resolved. Uh, what do we think uh, collectively? What are your thoughts about homeless veterans? And uh, yeah, I'm just looking for some suggestions because it's a concern right here in San Antonio. Sure. So um, I, I'll 
give a, a little bit of historic reference. So as early as 2013, 2014, maybe even back to 2010, uh, VA put a lot of emphasis on uh, ending, ending veteran uh, homelessness. When Eric Shinseki was the secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, it was one of the strategic priorities and it remained the top priority today. Uh, and so there has been a, um, a uh, significant amount of resources for funding, community engagement, uh, contracts for housing, uh, nationwide, coast to coast. Uh, and so most of the major metropolitan areas here in Texas, because I've worked in all of them now with the VA, Dallas, Austin, Houston, and San Antonio, have all actually been recognized by their respective communities, San Antonio being one, for effectively ending veteran homelessness. So what does that mean? So one of the things we have to remember when we, uh, when we talk about veteran homelessness is that we can engage a veteran on the street that may be homeless, uh, but you know, we cannot take the prisoner. Uh, and so if they, when a veteran is ready to engage us, right, a lot of it starts with building trust. Uh, so you get to know them, right? We provide uh, even primary care where they are. We'll meet you under a bridge. We'll meet you at the local McDonald's. You tell us where you want us to meet you. And we have primary care teams that will provide that care wherever they want it to be and get them comfortable with us. Uh, and at that point, yes, we will engage them. And we have contracts uh, throughout the uh, San Antonio and Bear County area for whether it's per diem housing, uh, we have... Um, uh, HUD BASH programs, right, where we, uh, once we transition out of uh, grant per diem type housing to, uh, to more permanent housing uh, from, uh, from HUD BASH. So we've got a very robust program, you know, 50 plus uh, homeless uh, uh, HUD BASH uh, uh, coordinators that are typically coordinating for us, you know, several hundred uh, veterans that were previously homeless in the, in the San Antonio and Bear County communities, all the way up to Kirk County. Uh, and so um, I think there was a lot of resourcing there. Uh, we've made a huge impact on this issue uh, across the country over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, but again, it's, it's a, one that starts with building trust. Uh, and so when a veteran is ready to engage us for housing, we have a multitude of locations available to house them, uh, but it's when they're ready to do so. Thank you. Anyone else want to add anything? Okay. Well, I think then that we've, we've really discussed a lot of the most important issues that we know veterans are facing and some of uh, what we know are services and opportunities as well as challenges that are available for them. And I think everybody uh, did just an excellent job on this and we appreciate that. Right now, we'd like to engage uh, our viewers again. We have some more uh, Q&A. Uh, so there's some Q&A in the chat box. There's about uh, three to five questions. And uh, first of all, um, what's the time frame for receiving veterans benefits? Uh, and so anyway, let's take a look at some of those questions that we may have there. Uh, see if we can answer any of those. Let's open up chat. Uh, Here's one from Jeff Fair, says there are so many resources. How do veterans know where to start? How do service providers know where their clients should start? Anyone wanna pick on that one? You know, it, Jeff, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are a bunch of resources available. Obviously you've got different entities here, right? With the panel that are talking to you about the services that we offer. Uh, most of them have a website. Uh, there are some also joint councils uh, throughout a lot of communities. I just pasted a link to your question as, uh, as, the, as the councilman was reading it. So uh, VA engages what are called CVEBs, uh, so Community Veteran Engagement Boards. Uh, we do have one of those uh, CVEBs here in San Antonio. I believe Keta Rodriguez uh, is the current chair of the CVEB. Uh, the link there will take you to the, the Community Veteran Engagement Boards that VA recognizes across the country and give you points of contact. Those CVEBs are a consolidation of a multitude of veteran-facing organizations. So that's just one resource that I'd recommend you might want to consider getting a little bit more about the CVEB here in San Antonio and Bear County and the entities that are part of it. Uh, but that's not the only resource. I just find it to be a very effective one. So when we have messages that we need to get out, questions about resources, um, we engage with the CVEB here. Very good. Uh, here's another question. From, oh, I'm sorry if you wanted to go ahead and answer. I just added a couple of uh, websites. One is Combined Arms. They're uh, more web-based and uh, mobile phone app-based. Uh, they do a great job of referral. Uh, the Texas Veterans Network, uh, that's our program. Uh, there's the um, website and the 800 number. 
if you call have somebody call in we'll figure out what they need uh, and then we can then uh, direct them to a the appropriate service provider thank you dr skull anyone else okay um karen uh olvera asks what is the time frame for receiving veteran benefits I defer to Chris on this if we're talking uh, just entry into the VA system. If we're talking other areas, then I can answer to that. Yeah, I guess it, it, to Paul's point, it's, it depends on the benefit we're talking about. So on the VBA side, you're talking service connection, you know, that someone's applied for, for compensatory benefits. It, it's going to depend. I know there are some national goals. I mean, somewhere around 120 days is what I recall hearing was the target from when a veteran submit that application for compensatory benefits to when they get a decision. Um, obviously, that, I'm sure that goal is not always met, uh, but that is the, the target that VA established for itself several years ago. And I think it's made quite a bit of progress, but as we're drawing down uh, military campaigns, I, I did just recently get notification that you know, there is a growing backlog. So they're asking uh, facilities and even network contractors to expand capacity on that side. Uh, on the healthcare side, if a veteran submits an application to us for healthcare enrollment, we have five days uh, from the date that that veteran submitted that application for healthcare benefits to give them a determination as to whether or not they're eligible. Uh, and so once we determine they're eligible for a primary care appointment uh, by statute, we have to have that appointment scheduled within 20 days. And for specialty care, uh, which would include in some cases behavioral health, if it's not acute or the medical or surgical subspecialty, that's 28 days. Now, and 28 days may seem like a long time, but I encourage you to try to call a community dermatologist and see how quickly you can get an appointment. It's probably six months. Uh, so uh, I think we're, we're doing fairly well. And I would, also, I would also remind the, the viewers that, uh, you know, the focus uh, seems to be on the, on the Veterans Administration, but not all veterans use the Veterans Administration. Some of us are retired and still use the, the military or TRICARE system. And there's, there's different issues sometimes with, associated with that. That's a good point. Uh, and, you know, we hadn't touched on TRICARE. I don't think we have anyone who can tell us uh, too much more about it. But, yeah, there are multiple systems, I guess, available for veterans uh, for services, not just the VA, not just TRICARE, but there's a lot of nonprofits in, in our community and around the country that dedicate themselves to helping veterans. Uh, here's something that Richard Hartley just said. Uh, he just finished a DOJ study on veterans treatment courts and veterans reported to us that due to stigma or fear of loss of benefits, they were reluctant to sign up for services and or treatment. This was especially the case for veterans and older era uh, from older era conflicts. I think this kind of falls into a bit of a discussion we were having a few minutes ago. But let me ask, uh, do we believe there's a distinction between the veterans today from, let's say, the last 15 years compared to the veterans uh, from the Vietnam era earlier before that or just after? Chris, you're shaking your head. Uh, yeah, I, I, I am. Um, but I think the, <laughs> the differences may depend on point of view. I think they're all kind of saying something similar but from a different, different point of view. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll give you those points of view and not, not necessarily tell you their mind. These are the, the differences that I hear. Uh, what I'll hear from um, our Vietnam, World War II, and Korea War veterans is that, um, you know, they, well, for one, their trust scores with VA tend to be much higher uh, than for our OEF, OIF uh, veterans uh, that are you know, typically just getting out of service. And so we do see that reliance on VA healthcare definitely starts to change their perception of us over time. Uh, but in some cases, our older veterans or feel like the younger veterans are, in their terms, more entitled. I don't see it that way at all. I think there are generational differences, right? I'm, I'm more in line with the OEF, OIF veterans for, just based on my age. Uh, I think we tend to be less patient. Uh, but because they don't have that history with VA and haven't seen the agency change over time to appreciate the changes, all they know is what they see today. And so if we're not meeting those expectations today, that's what matters to them. Uh, so I can value uh, that you know, difference of perspective. They don't have the historic context. Uh, and I don't necessarily see it as an issue of entitlement. Uh, you know, our veterans are told that there are certain benefits that they're entitled to as a result of their military service. And so they're absolutely entitled to pursue those benefits to the full extent of the law. 
Dr. Skoll, how about you? Do you have a view on I think that? that uh, I think there are some differences. I think that uh, the experiences from World War II, Korea, Vietnam were much different than uh, more recent experiences. I think the challenges in each uh, combat area were different, but I think the end result of what it does to the individual remains the same. I think we still have those same issues across the board, just the causes are different. Okay, um, let's, let's ask an, or answer another question, uh, again from Karen Olvera. Are there types of health programs available to rural or urban veterans? Are there any differences or are there special programs? That is a really, really good question, uh, Karen. So, you know, uh, rural health is an area of emphasis for, uh, for VHA. I was just answering a suspense on that today. Uh, and so, um, you know, as we've gotten more complex with our analytics, you know, we are able to identify where there may be gaps in service, uh, drive times, those sorts of things based upon proximity. Uh, and so in some cases, rural veterans may be more um, uh, apt to receive care in the community at VA expense because of that distance. Uh, we've also been more aggressive reaching out to that population for some of our virtual health modalities. So um, uh, whether it's uh, a lot of our mental health appointments these days are actually virtual. A lot of our rural health veterans, have said they appreciate that flexibility. They don't have to drive all the way in. Uh, and in some cases, when we have veterans that live in rural communities that don't have a good uh, like Wi-Fi, right? So they're not able to connect to the internet to even have a digital connection with VA. We can actually issue them digital devices now that come with a data plan paid for by VA uh, so that they can connect with us from their home just as any other veteran would be able to. A question I'm gonna add is uh, about veterans and going back to work and getting into the workforce today. Uh, you know, what kind of challenges do we think they're facing uh, that there are programs available to help with. I'll open that up to any of you who'd like to make a comment on that. I think one, uh, one challenge that uh, we have as veterans is how to translate military to civilian. And so when you write a resume, when you're starting that search for employment after transitioning out of the military, uh, I think it's very important to translate that to uh, what's applicable to what you're applying for, but be able to translate that to a civilian position. Uh, I served as a security forces squadron commander. That translates to chief of police. Serve as a deputy group commander for mission support group. That translates to assistant city manager. So if you can make those transitions, and there's a number of sources out there, books, websites on how to do that translation. Okay, any other thoughts? No, I, to I totally agree. And uh, that, that becomes a, a very, very good, uh, uh, difficult issue. Also the environment, uh, the environment in which they work in the military and the environment they work in the, in the civilian sector uh, are, very, are very different. You know, if you take a look here, here I am in an office, you know, versus out, out, in, out, in, out in the field. And uh, the, Organization and politics within the within the commercial the, the commercial sector is much different than the than the than the government. The government tends to be more social, uh, uh, listic, where you know everybody knows each other by their rank. They have a they have an order and command structure. They they know that they're taken care of, and there's a camaraderie that's a little bit different than on the on the commercial side. Uh, their time is billable. Their time is. Is 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 a uh, investment in a, in a company and to produce a certain amount of widgets. Uh, that's that there there there's some challenges in there in trying to get used to that. And uh, the best thing that I would do is to advocate that they have mentors and they have uh, folks that they can use in the network to help prepare them uh, two years out before they make that transition. Uh, part of that is getting certifications, training, but also uh, I know that there's a program right now that they allow folks that are transitioning to actually spend time in the corporate world uh, and, and have that experience before they actually retire. Very good. Any other thoughts or questions on our concerns on that? Hey, John, my, my comment was also in the context of, um, you know, any entities 
in the community or the county who want to assist veterans should also try to use, you know, more all encompassing language um, than just veterans, right? Maybe, you know, do you have service, a uh, record of military service or have you served the country? Um, just again, because some, some don't want to identify as veterans and, and just the way that um, some of the comments have been, that would, that, that might be able to, you know, um, get more people connected with, with services. Yeah, I and think John's my council person and my neighbor. So thank you, John, for doing this. Thank you. You know, that's, that's a, an excellent point to make. I, I think even if uh, I'm out in the field and I'm, I'm uh, talking to someone who's homeless, maybe instead of asking them, are you a veteran? I need to start saying, you know, have you had an opportunity to serve the country and how, how do you serve the country? What was your service like as, as an opening remark? And I think, you know, you're bringing up a really good point that all of us need to consider. Uh, a lot of people say to a veteran, thank you for your service. Uh, but, you know, I think we need to be able to explore that a little more deeply. You know, we appreciate any service that you provided to this country. I think all of us agree that service to your country or service to your community is a significant aspect of everybody's role as a citizen. So, you know, thank you for bringing it up, Richard. Well, I think we've gotten through uh, most of what we'd had in the way of questions and our, our time is kind of working its way through. Uh, I wanna go ahead once more and thank all of our participants. I believe they, they all did just an excellent job uh, and I've learned more. And I hope that the, the people who've been watching, whether you're uh, students or members of the community, uh, that you've learned enough to leave this with more knowledge that you can use in the community and understanding the value of these kinds of programs uh, that, you know, Dr. Crossman has bought, brought forward for us uh, in order to expand our understanding of our community and the issues that our community faces. So uh, I'll go ahead now, I think, and and turn it over for a few more remarks to one other speaker that I didn't introduce earlier, but I'd like to have her talk with us. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Sandra Morissette. She's the chairman of the psychology department at UTSA, and, and she's going to visit with us for a few minutes. Thanks so much. So um, I think I have about three minutes, so I'm going to either talk auctioneer style. Um, <laughs> I have to say, this was an incredibly exciting panel for me, and the congregation of such distinguished panelists is really exciting because you are all really leaders that are shaping what's happening in San Antonio. And if I could just word cloud this a little bit, some of the, the, the ideas that really came strongly through to me are this idea of making sure that we're connecting and advocating. How do we help um, veterans to, to gain access. I love the idea of this, um, this metaphor of a net where we all come together and stronger we are together so that veterans don't slip through the cracks. And I think that's really important because we have to get veterans connected. We have to deal with real trust issues, which those data on 90% trust are so exciting. Having had worked in the VA for 18 years, I know the his history of trust in, in the VA. And for those numbers to turn around are really exciting. And to address um, stigma, um, there were also really important ideas about um, looking at mental health as seriously as physical health and to understand mental health on a spectrum. It's not you have it or you don't. And that's what our diagnostic classification system would have us believe. It's a yes PTSD or a no PTSD. Well, we're gearing up to publish some work that sub-threshold PTSD, they don't quite meet criteria and yet they're having functional impairment. And my passion is about how do we get veterans back to living the lives that they want to be living, even with mental health conditions. We have to figure out the problems of isolation, which was also mentioned, and we have to really get a strong grasp on, on the suicide rates. And that's a tricky wicket because VA and DOD, I think, have engaged in more activities 
for suicide prevention um, than anyone else. They really have bolstered their, their suicide prevention programs. And the needle isn't really moving entirely. I mean, it's still 17 a day. It's, it's, it's a huge problem that's deeply concerning. And the last piece that I'll end with is um, the idea that, that this is not just affecting veterans, this is affecting their families. And so some of the work that we've been doing is to try and, and you hopefully saw a link in the chat, is to engage concerned significant others. How do we help them navigate these systems to gain access? How do we get them connected? And it's not simply knowing the phone number to call. How do we get them to want to be connected? And families, I think, are a critical piece to that picture. We just um, ran some preliminary um, analyses in the context of COVID, and we did some social networking. And we were finding that veterans have, on average, three social supports. And 70% of them said that they didn't know if they could go to one of those social supports for help. How are we getting, getting sort of um, armor around them in the form of social support to get them connected to services, to find out what those services are? Can we invoke the support of family members who desperately want to help them? And I think this is really critical work for San Antonio. We're Military City USA. And so when we think of that net, um, we've got so many resources. We've got all the, the institutions from the, from the panelists. Um, UTSA has people doing research. There was someone uh, proposing an app with AI. We have AI specialists, and I'm happy to connect you with someone on that. And um, really exciting work going on. Homelessness was mentioned. Dr. Jack Sai just joined San Antonio. He's a national authority on homelessness, UT Austin. We've got that network. We have to figure out how do we get us all together in the same room at the same table. Thanks. This was a really super exciting panel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we really appreciate it, Dr. Marisette. Once more, I want to thank uh, Ted Terrasas, Christopher Sandless, uh, Dr. Paul Skoll, uh, and everyone involved in this great seminar today, this panel discussion. Uh, and uh, that should be the conclusion. We wish everybody well and have a great day. And uh, UTSA football, going good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.